My name is Dmitry Afonasyev. I am a network architecture of Yandex. I will tell you about uh, a very exotic uh, technology, which I think will become less and less exotic, more and more popular. So, saying that, let me highlight my topic as distributed uh, machine learning technologies and in work in network computation. Let me briefly tell you what neural networks are about, how they function, how they are trained. We'll speak about the distributed distance learning training, uh, how traffic patterns look like, and uh, how they can be uh, laid over interconnect topologies. And last but not least, I'll speak about in-network compute implementations. Before I proceed to the topic at hand, let me tell you that um, the progress goes to the fact that the network which lies in the middle, it has to be fast, simple, inexpensive, and uh, fault free, but any rule has exemptions. So there are some specific applications which uh, computation system and uh, the data exchange system look like that, that once you do some computation on the network, you may optimize these computations and we'll see how the goals and uh, problems look like. And you can add the uh, usability once you do computation in the network. So what neural, neural network is about? So you may see a biological neuron on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see the mathematical model of this neuron. It's uh, structured very easily. So it has ins which uh, receive certain signals. And uh, there are some scales. And there is a distortion inside the vector of inbound uh, activators is being complemented by impulses. And this goes to some processor, which uh, gives an outbound signal. And it means this uh, system has to be monotonous, uh, homogeneous and modified because this is how the training looks like. The same thing, but in more detail with their equation accompanying it. You may see that here we calculate uh, the classical uh, weights uh, connection. And uh, these neurons um, make up a neural network. It has an in bound uh, level which here which doesn't do anything but acts only as a receiver of certain uh, inbound messages and then there are several layers on which this information is processed there are input and output layers which we call and we also have some hidden layers which are not input or output layers there can be several different hidden layers and the neural network can have this structure. The structure is not chaotic. We just process something in one node, then it is passed on to the next node, and so on. And uh, we will see how the machine learning is happening. And finally, neural networks have two different modes of functioning. Uh, there are two methods of doing something with them. First, they have the inference mode. That is, this network works like an ordinary network. We provide some input data there, and it gives us the output. This is what is called inference. To get some networks which will do classification or some other useful things, we first need to train the network. That's the training mode. Those modes have a different number of uh, calculations and data. 
inference is done with a small amount of data. Training is done with a large amount of data. In it, the data moves both backward and forward. There is a direct path. We get the result. We look at the errors, at the deviations from what we are supposed to get. And then we send the information about this error back so that the system adapts to the new situation. As a result, learning is all about risk minimization. As a result, we do have a resulting function from this neural network and the data that we would ideally have. The difference between what we wanted to get and what the function gave us is a loss function, and we want to minimize those losses. To minimize them, we use the stochastic gradient descent method. In a neural network, there are many neurons, many connections, and uh, now, when we present this a network, we want to minimize uh, the losses in every neuron of the network, which is a difficult task. As for gradient, we choose a big learning uh, selection, and uh, based on that selection, which should be a big selection, we can minimize the losses. If it's a small selection, then the network might make mistakes or learn badly. It's not necessary to use the full set of input data all the time. We can use uh, a certain set of this data, then we can do the computations, and uh, it will be a pretty good gradient as a result. Thus, we do not take the whole data set for every iteration. We take a subset. We do the calculations with this subset. And finally, we have several different types of output data. And when we go through the whole set of data, this is called uh, one era of training, and then we repeat the cycle all over again. In order to calculate the gradient after we did those computations, we go backwards along the network. We are not going to look at the equations in detail, but this is a very effective method of computations because it uh, considers uh, the network's structure. And uh, this method is called backpropagation algorithm. It is much more effective than if uh, we tried to calculate the gradient by brute force. It takes into account the similar structure of the network and it uses earlier calculations and computations. The process can be presented as the following flows, the following flow graph. Here we have the direct data propagation, and here we have the backward propagation. This is where the computations go to, towards, uh, go in the other direction. And finally, the computations should reach those points in the chart that we are trying to optimize. To sum up, the backpropagation algorithm is an optimized method of calculating the or computing the gradient. It uses the information about how the network is structured. Then this information is uh, propagated backwards. The derivatives are computed and calculated. And uh, the rule, the chain rule for complex derivatives um, is used because every function in a neural network uh, is based on the previous functions, on previous levels. Now that we 
got an understanding of how a neural network is uh, organized, uh, we can see what happens during the neural network training. We start with randomly initialized weights, and we iterate through our data a mini batch of training data sample. There is the forward pass, the backward pass, and we are interested in training because reference is easier than training because there are no uh, difficult uh, computations there. They are less complex anyway. So the forward pass looks like a path along which the data follows. There is the input, the output. So this data moves along the network, and we get a certain result. If the mini batch has the size of more than one, it usually has. It's not called a vector then. It's called a matrix. And each interim result is also a matrix. This is what normally happens with uh, the mini batch, and this is effective because a GPU is uh, aimed uh, at working with metrics. Within each level, we multiply the matrices, uh, the matrix of activation, the matrix of input weight, and we get the output matrix. As a result, when we ran the forward pass, we got a certain result. And then we have a value that we would like to have. When we get both of them, we calculate the loss with our loss function. And we get the loss value that we would like to optimize, actually. After having computed the losses, we go backwards along the network. And the goal of this backward pass is to compute the updates to the layer weights and how the neurons in the network should be shifted. So we send information about the error backwards along the network. Every level calculates the gradient uh, of uh, the weight and updates the weights. And each level calculates the activation gradient and gives it back to the previous level. In terms of the structure, the computations uh, really resemble what we had in the direct pass. But uh, the matrix is, is calculated in the other direction. We go backwards along the network, and we calculate the weight updates. At the input, we have uh, current weights. At the output, we have new modified weights. And the operation is about updating each weight while taking into account the current gradient. In practice, the computations can be a little bit different but the structure of uh, computations uh, is still the same. What is important is that uh, those computations can use much more memory than the model itself, particularly if uh, some other information, such uh, as uh, current uh, states, uh, is stored in the memory. So this is what we have at each stage of the computations. First, there is the forward pass, where the matrices are multiplied. Then we have the backward pass, where we have the weight gradients and the activation gradients. And finally, we take uh, the weight matrix, we add the update matrix to it, and we get the final matrix. What is important is that all those computations can be done in parallel, because the training task is a very complex one for a 
neural network. And one way to simplify it is to make it parallel. Without uh, making it parallel, it can take weeks or months to train a neural network, and we want to do it faster. How can we achieve this parallelism? There can be different methods. One method is data parallel, and the other method is model parallel. And the model parallel can be split into the interlayer and the interlayer. Data parallel is where we give different computations uh, to different nodes in the network using different input data. We use different nodes to compute results from different data. If we talk about model parallel, we can calculate different sections within the same layer, actually different uh, neurons. Uh, we can even use different machines. Uh, or we can use different levels uh, to calculate them at different uh, neurals of the network. Each model of parallelism has a different structure of data flow. And we are going to focus on data parallelism. It is uh, more simple. And this is what we have with data parallelism. Each worker has a copy of the entire neural network model and is responsible for computing a portion of data or training mini-batch. During the forward pass, it computes output activations for its portion of mini-batch and no communication is needed. The communication is started at the backward pass because uh, each worker computes activation gradients for its portion of mini-batch and it computes contribution to the weight gradient based on its portion of mini-batch, after which all workers should sum their contribution to the weight update. Each worker calculates or computes its own contribution only for this particular mini-batch, and then all the contributions are summed up to get the necessary weight update. So, data parallel of forward passes. Uh, here you can see that all the nodes work within uh, the same weight matrix. So, here it works with the same input data. Here there is work with different uh, data. And the most interesting is communication. And there is one mechanism which is called overuse, which is a typical operation. For supercomputers, there are a lot of typical operations. Everyone is aware of them. So all reduce is uh, one of the most popular systems. And uh, actually, we reduce or get together or sum all the results of interim computations, and then we spread the result to every node. There are many methods of implementing all reduce. Those choices have uh, different um, expenses, of, but uh, the worst solution is uh, when every worker gives its results to all the other workers, but nobody does it like this. Uh, there are more efficient methods, such as uh, the so-called ring reduction or the one-shot reduction. One-shot reduction is usually used uh, for switches where all the nodes see all the other nodes. Uh, not necessarily why one hop, but uh, they are within walking distance. And uh, those reductions can also work in hierarchy. And there is a pretty big communication overlap here, which uh, grows together with the degree of parallelism. We are going to look at it later. As for the model parallel within the layer or between layers, 
This is a picture of how these tasks are implemented. So why is it important to include communication between nodes? This is a chart which we drew based on a certain test cluster. There is a GPU power here. The GPU was pretty good. And the other chart is about data exchange. And we can see that our GPU, which is very expensive, remains idle during the exchange of some data. So in real life, we don't want this equipment to stay idle. How are our traffic flows organized and how are they connected with the interconnectors? A little bit about group and collective operations. And that's where we have one data set and we give some data to all the other nodes. Sometimes uh, this data is scattered, sometimes there is a reduction when we bring different pieces together and try to compute something new based on them. An important part of reduction is that the size of data does not change after reduction. That is, we have a certain size of data in every node, and when we summed all this data, we have the same amount of data with the same size, but it takes into account all the other data. A naive one-shot reduction doesn't scale, it's not effective. There are different implementations. For example, the so-called RIN or reduce which boils down to the fact that we have nodes on phase one. This is a closed loop, and all the data, all the results are communicated to the next node. And finally, every node gets its own result, and then it replicates this result to all the other nodes. If we have a hierarchy and different axes of loops, this topology becomes hierarchical, and uh, it goes well together with the classical topology of uh, interconnectors, because here we have indirect or switched networks, which are not directly connected to other nodes, and those nodes are connected to switches. There are interconnection networks, which are called direct, or which are called P2P or point-to-point, -point. when actually have the computation elements included, and many supercomputer networks, and many clusters historically actually are not embedded. and. Uh, Multiple collective operations uh, actually are good for such an interconnect function. And if we speak about the machine learning, then probably uh, Google, for instance, um, does their own processors for machine learning, and they're also doing some clusters for that. And the ETV clusters topology looks like that, and uh, it allows for uh, the extrapolation of that uh, topology on the cluster, but not everyone can actually do such intertwined connectors. So what can be done? What if switches could also compute something? Hence uh, the in-network computation. We'll look at the two applications. First of all, Sharp. This is an in-network scalable hierarchical aggregation and reduction protocol the computation in network from uh, Ivanov company and uh, all reduce example switch to trees uh, reduce to trees they optimize the reduction objective and there is one more type of calculation of reduction this is for instance uh, a tree 
uh, through which uh, the operations may go. This is a logical tree. It reflects the topology of the network. And if we speak about three direct or switch-based network, then actually it may um, be reflected incorrectly, causing some overload. One of the implementations of all reduce, this is a recursive doubling. So it goes in several stages. What Sharp does, Sharp, first of all, is based on the following that uh, within the commutator, we have uh, some logical networks uh, where devices which may do some computation, for instance, it would be enough uh, just to uh, do addition, but they may act with uh, the HPC-based uh, popular data. And in the case of Sharp, you will also build an aggregation tree, that's a logical one, extrapolated against the topology of the network. So what happens? We have some interim calculations, and uh, these data actually would be sent down the tree. And once it goes up the tree, reduction will take place. And uh, certain nodes would assign certain data for the reduction cell, and the system would reduce the data to one. So they got several data sets uh, from different nodes. Once you add those vectors, only one vector goes up. This goes to the root of the tree, and the root of the tree would get uh, the final sum. And then it would go up from the root to the crown to the top, and the final result would be distributed on all the nodes which participate in the computation. In that case, we're speaking about seed. And uh, this operation looks very efficiently. Uh, this operation would not go smoothly once there are some losses in that network and we had to use certain supports. But uh, in case of a sharp, it works smoothly. There is another quite important thing. It is not that switches do computation very quickly, but they do a very simple operation. They just do addition, so they're located in the right place in order to do computation. After we added uh, the switches, um, less data is being passed over to the next stage. And not only we do the right operation, but we reduce the volume or the scope of data, which would be transmitted further. For instance, here on that flow chart, we may see how that approach may be used um, in application to the band. But actually, it's good once you can use that for the latency. You may see that the latency remains the same. Constant, certainly, this is not true. It is a logarithmic dependence and would depend on the number of tiers or layers. See, in essence, this is a multiplicity of uh, tiers. And everything would depend on the number of tiers, not on the number of nodes which are engaged in the computation. Bear in mind that switches uh, are of big size. It means that you may have uh, may have very good latency even when the clusters are big. But we're speaking not only about the retention or latency and about the cluster size. Uh, there is some results obtained when uh, training the uh, networks, we can more specifically say that uh, we may only benefit uh, from the use of sharp for AI. So bear in mind uh, uh, the modern GPU and how that corresponds to the computation. 10% in the productivity growth may actually pay off the whole project. 
And one more application. This is not a production value, but it is more affordable because it implies less costly equipment. So for some research purposes, it may be more affordable. And even if you don't have a big cluster, switch ML looks nice. The same problem. The distributed learning. When you calculate your interim results, you have to aggregate them and do that efficiently. And you want to do that using switches. What can it be done on? Here we may remember that we have uh, programmable chips from Barefoot Company. They don't have the floating point support, and uh, still they can work with digits. But still, it can be used um, in order to build a working structure in the net. So, but it would be labor intensive. It would require certain efforts and would be actually some distribution of responsibilities between workers and switches. Workers would chunk up vectors, would quantize and scale, because actually floating point has to be moved. Switch doesn't know what else to do. And as far as this is a regular package network with losses, we will have to be able to detect and recover from package drops or losses. Switch will integrate vector addition and count and compare how the operations are done. I will not go into the details, but quantization we convert floating point. Uh, they have different orders or different factors and uh, desirably in terms of the scale, it should not have um, much deviations. An important thing is about the uh, packet loss resistance. So packets uh, may be lost in two directions. Workers should detect losses using timers. Loss packages would be retransmitted. If a switch gets the same package for more than one time, actually, it would be just uh, dropped the switches by means of bitmaps would uh, um, identify uh, actually what uh, packages are received and would ignore duplets or duplication. Then the whole structure works with a kind of a zoo of technologies, but it's at the same time, different frameworks are being supported. And this is appropriate for machine learning. That's actually the cluster where the tests were done. And here we see that this cluster works much faster. It's a prototype which is based not on the most efficient technologies, but what is available. And uh, it proves to be quite efficient against the option which uh, does not imply the computation on the switches. Anyway, it would be more than one, and sometimes even it would equal three. What is so important? The experiments show that the performance does not depend on the number of workers, unlike the options with no computation done on switches. But it performs very well when the package losses are quite reasonable. And uh, point 0.1, this is an average loss race. And uh, point 0.01 actually looks better. And finally, let me go into the detail as to how the package loss tolerance is being built. At the stage of aggregation, we ignore duplication, and so we are looking for the default. And when the results are disseminated, we open the result. And if the worker has not received the result, then it would uh, resend the inquiry. So the system 
is a two-way street. Sharp and switch ML. Uh, actually, are described by multiple resources. They are open source, and uh, the presentation will be available online as well. Your questions are most welcome. Thank you so much, Dmitry, for a very interesting uh, presentation. But please visit our chat so that there were people who are very, who are very much interested in your presentation. So it would be great if you get in touch with them. I will try to do my best to, to do that.